ranch potatoes. So ribs and ranch potatoes, that cost us $4 if you want to sign up. I think that's all the announcements I have. Does anybody have anything else? Nope, nothing. Awesome. Uh, those privileged to lead us in our services tonight, our opening prayer will be by David Lee. Uh, our song leader tonight is David Arthur. Our devotional tonight is me, Josh Terry. And closing us out in prayer tonight is Mr. Trevor Wilkerson. Without further ado, David. Let's pray. Our most gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. We thank you, Father, for your Son who died on the cross for us. And we thank you, Father, that we have an opportunity to be here tonight to study your marvelous word and to sing songs to your praise. We thank you, Father, for this congregation, for its elders. And we pray, Father, that you would help us always to live in such a way that we glorify your name. We ask you, Father, to be with us through the remaining portions of this worship, to watch over us and care for us. In Christ's name, amen. Good afternoon, church family. Uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is such a, uh, a blessing to be with y'all. Um, so last time I had the opportunity to speak to y'all, I talked about fellowship, and, and we, we looked at that word fellowship and what it meant, and we looked a little deeper into it, and we examined it, and we talked about how it wasn't just like, hey, man, we, we had, we had this, these people over to our house last night, and it was just, man, it was great fellowship. It was great fellowship, you know, and it's not just hanging out. It's this idea of, of sharing a life. Sharing a, a time with each other and, and sharing experiences. And we talked about the experiences of, of Jesus and, and how powerful that was. Um, and that's what fellowship means. But it means more than that, right? It continues on. Um, so not only is it sharing things with, of your life with somebody, but it, it hits us and... I'm going to be 100% honest with you. Um, in talking about sharing stuff of your life, I realize that I'm not the best at that. I'm not the best at sharing my experiences and, and moments with people. I'm always like, oh, yeah, that's great. That's nice. Woohoo! Yay. Um, but I'll tell you something I'm even worse at. Sharing my stuff. Sharing my things. Um, if you have your Bibles and want to follow along, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 4. Um, 
This one really hits home for me in the idea of sharing the things that we have. Um, Acts chapter 4, starting in verse 32. So, um, to give you some backstory, this is after the day of Pentecost. This is after uh, 3,000 souls were added on that day. And then in Acts chapter 2, we read, you know, hey, they continued adding to the church daily. And then in Acts chapter 4, we have no idea how many are there. It could be 6,000. It can be 2. Uh, it's probably not 2. There's 3,000 on the first day. It's not 2. But it's a lot of people, most likely, and it's gathering there. And so in 32, we read, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said to any of the things that they belonged to him that it was his own. But they had everything in common. And I want to pause right there because that verse right there, a lot of people jump and grab that verse. And they hold it up and they say, See, communism is the way. And they hold it. And we're like, No. Oh. No, that's not the way. That's not what's right. Communism's not their answer. Because this is such a, a scary verse for us. We're like, no, 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 no. Wait, hold on. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. There is not, here it is, a needy person among them all. Uh, for as many as were owners of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed as each as any had need. See, a lot of times we get that fear of, of communism, right? We get that fear of, of some hobo walking in off the street and they come into your house and they knock and they say, Hey, I'm a Christian. I'm staying on your couch tonight. And we're like, we don't know you, dude. But that's not the sharing that's happening here. If you look at this church in the first century, they know each other. They're literally fellowshipping with each other. They're sharing their lives with each other. People are so connected in this first century church that their brothers and sisters in Christ recognize needs and their other brother and sister in Christ. So uh, a silly example would be, this is not your toddler sitting next to you at the table, and they have their sippy cup there, and you have a big glass of sweet tea, and they say, I want a drink, I want a drink, and you're like, well, you can drink your sippy cup, and they're like, no, I want a drink of yours, and they grab your, your cup, and they, they drink it, and you get the macaroni and the, the backwash into it, you know? Yeah, that's not what we're talking about. In fact, what we're talking about is if we had two glasses of sweet tea sitting in front of us and we recognized that they needed a drink, they didn't have a drink, and we are providing them with one. It is such a, an important aspect of our lives to, to share things, to look and to be integrated in each other's lives, to realize, hey, I have something that would be a blessing to someone else. I have a cabinet. I have a whatever here that's an extra that I don't use. Maybe somebody at the church could use that. And me knowing my brothers and sisters in Christ and, and knowing if there is a, someone that is just renovating their house or moving into a new house and you're like, hey, I've got this, this old desk, I've got this old cabinet, I've got this dresser, would you be interested in it? And them saying, well, of course I would. That will save us from having to go buy a new one for Sally, for Bill, for Joe. It would be such a, a blessing to be on those people. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what fellowship entails. Whenever we say we have fellowship with one another, it's not just the idea of hanging out together. It's not just the idea of sharing our lives together. It's not just the idea of, of being close to one another, but it's this idea of sharing things with each other as well. And how important it is for us to, to look and see the needs and fill the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I tell you, there is probably the most important need of all is that of Jesus and if maybe you've never had the opportunity to have that need filled, you can do so tonight. Maybe you 
had that need filled a long time ago, but you've lost it. You've forgotten. You've fallen away. You've slipped away. And you need to come back to him tonight. We ask that you do so as we stand and as we sing. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to come here and worship you without persecution. And we thank you for all the blessings that you give us each and every day. And we pray that you give us the strength to share our blessings with people in need. And we thank you most of all for sending Jesus to die on the cross. And in his name, amen. Good evening. The psalmist David gives us four things to do in the Lord. In this lesson, I want to investigate these four things. And the first of these is trust in the Lord. If you would, go ahead and get your Bibles out and turn to Psalms 37. And this is a psalm of David that starts off by offering encouragement to believers. David gives us some instructions here on how to live our lives in the Lord. Again, Psalms 37, beginning in verse 1, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Notice, if you will, as we were reading, there are four things that, tell, that David tells us to either uh, in the Lord, to do in the Lord, Or to the Lord. These are what I call the four in the Lord commands. Number one, there is trust. Number two, there is delight. And three, there is commit. And the fourth one is rest. 
And I'd like to examine each one of these commands one by one. I want to give you some examples of people who really illustrated these four statements of things to do in the Lord. And also how you and I can fulfill these things today. These are the things that are great for each of us to do. And there's really brilliant advice from the man after God's own heart. So let's, let's get started with the first of the four. The statement, trust in the Lord. The first command to trust in the Lord is perhaps really, if you think seriously about it, is important. Because it's a stepping stone to the rest of them. Let's take some, some time tonight to examine some biblical characters and how they trusted in the Lord. And let's start by talking about Abraham. Abraham was one who completely trusted in the Lord. He left his home at the Lord's command and trusted in the Lord to fulfill the daily needs of himself, his wife, and all of his camp. What impresses me the most, though, is how Abraham trusted the Lord with his son Isaac. Allow me to set up the story, and if you will be turning to Genesis chapter 22, Abraham had been waiting on the promise of the Lord for a son that would be his heir. God said it would come through Sarah, but Abraham grew unsure and impatient. He has Ishmael with his wife's maidservant, Hagar, but the Lord still would remain faithful to his promise. Sarah was nearly 100 years old when she gave birth to Isaac. Ishmael and Hagar were sent away, and Abraham loved Isaac. This child was the fulfillment of the promise from the Lord over many years. He had waited and waited, and just when it seemed all hope was lost, the Lord came through, through and gave him Isaac. Isaac would be what made Abraham happy. It made him proud. Isaac would be the heir. Now that we've set the story and how much Isaac meant to Abraham, let's see how Abraham had to trust in the Lord. Starting in verse 1 in Genesis chapter 22, it said, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering. And he rose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself and the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together, then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. 
Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram that caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering. Instead of his son, and Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. In the mound of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you and multiplying. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they, they rose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Brethren, what great faith. Just what great faith. Trust. As a parent, can you just imagine how gut-wrenching this command from the Lord was for Abraham? God had fulfilled his promise to give you a son, an heir, and now he wants you to sacrifice him like an animal? Abraham would have to have complete and total trust in the Lord. This is the God who brought you out of your homeland and is promising to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. This is the God who has protected you and made you to prosper. This is the God who opened your wife's womb to childbirth at nearly 100 years old. Surely, surely this God would be able to raise your heir back from the dead. Surely this God would not break his promise. He never has before, so why would he now? This is an act of a man who completely, completely trusted the Lord. Let's now consider another character, and you can probably guess who that is. Turn with me to the book of Job. In chapter 1, we see Satan interacting with God. And Satan thought that none would remain faithful to the Lord. But God knew that Job would. And Satan uh, struck Job with tragedy in chapter 1, starting in verse 13. It says, Now there was a day when his son and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. When the... Sabines raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, and burned up the sheep, said the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep, and the servants consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Guess what? bad day. While he was still speaking another also came and said the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away yes and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking another also came and said your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head and he fell to the ground and worshiped and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord in all this. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Throughout the whole ordeal, Job remained faithful to the Lord. The question is, would we? Would you and I? Not only does this happen to Job, but once again he is put through even more by Satan. Starting in chapter 2 in uh, 
verses 1 through 10, again, he has a talk with the Lord. He basically tells the Lord that these people, that they will not stay faithful to him. And the Lord tells him that Job will. But he also, and in that conversation, he tells him, I'll put him in your hands. I'll put him in your hands. But Satan, you can't kill him. This man has lost not only his property, but his children. Not only that, but now he was stricken with painful boils all over his body. How would we react? Would we pity ourselves? Would we follow the advice of Job's wife to curse God and die? Or would we react like Job? He was suffering physically and emotionally, yet he still remained faithful to the Lord and trusted him. Notice the incredible wisdom of Job. When he states, shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? Job realized that not only good things happen in life, but also bad. In the good times as well as in the bad times was important to Job to remain faithful to the Lord. He knew that everything he had came from the Lord, everything he had belonged to the Lord, and that none of it was his own. Job understood that even in extreme adversity, God would remain faithful to him. So he must remain faithful to the Lord. I pray that we can do the same. You know, I like to spend time around people older than myself, and I know that you are probably thinking, David, hard to find someone older than you. But that is something I have done ever since I was a child. I like to listen to the experience and the advice that the older, more experienced people have to give. I like to learn from them and perhaps gain some of their wisdom. I spent some time recently looking at some of my father's notes where he had spent some time talking to some older folks about their relationships and what he uh, would lead to healthy relationships. Many of them had been married for 40, 50, and 60 years. They all gave him basically the same top two things that were the most important to a good relationship. The number one thing was communication. This should come as no surprise to anyone who's been in a relationship for a long time. The number two thing was trust. For many of the people my dad talked to, according to his notes, was trust. That was their number one. They told him that trust was extremely important. A lack of trust would lead to suspicion and closing oneself off from the other spouse. This would cause the relationship to spiral downward and out of control. If they fully trusted their spouse, they would be able to be open and honest about everything. There would be no secrets and there would be no anxiety about how they were going to be treated. All of the negative emotions associated with that simply don't appear when you fully trust someone. This, in their opinion, leads to a healthy, happy, and loving relationship. But stop and think about something. You and I. You and I are in a relationship with God. And like our earthly relationship, it is important that it be healthy relationship. This, brethren, involves trust. We have to be able to trust in the Lord completely in order to have a healthy relationship with him. We have to be able to tell the Lord everything and not want to hold things back. We need to be able to tell the Lord when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're angry, confused, or any other thing that might be going on. We need to be able to trust the Lord with our hearts our family, our finances, our jobs, our emotions, and everything else in our lives. Only then, only then will we be able to stop relying on ourselves and the world and completely rely on God. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. The Lord, and he will not let you down. He didn't let down Abraham. He didn't let down Job. And I tell you what, he won't let us down either. Look back at Psalms 37 again, if you would. Now we move on to the second point that David makes. We read verse 4, where David writes, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. What do you think of when you think of delight? Is it something that you feel, something you do, or something that just happens? What can get in the way of delighting in the Lord? What is there about the Lord to delight in? There are the questions I want to answer if I can. To take delight in something is a conscious choice that you have to make. It isn't an emotion like happy and angry or confused. You are the one that makes the choice as to whether or not you delight in something. To delight in something takes effort. It is something you have to work for. You have to learn how to appreciate something before you can take pleasure from it. If you receive a flower from someone, it makes you happy, right? But it isn't something that you necessarily delight in. However, when you plant a seed, you put effort into making it grow. You may fertilize it, you water it, you nurture it. My grandfather used to grow roses. He would sit outside on a long porch in Tennessee and actually talk to the roses because he believed that it helped them to grow. When you go through effort like that, it makes you appreciate the flower. You appreciate the effort it took to grow it. You appreciate the process that the flower has gone through, starting as a seed until now as a beautiful mature plant sits before you. You see the flower in a different light than you do the one given to you. You now take delight in the flower. Just like the roses my grandfather grew, in order to delight in the Lord, we must work on our relationship with him. We must tend to it. We must communicate with the Lord daily. We must put work and effort into it. If we don't do that, we cannot possibly take delight in the Lord. We cannot appreciate and have pleasure in God. We cannot delight in the Lord if we love the world. Now that we have defined delight, I want to bring to light is something that makes it impossible to delight in the Lord. You cannot, you cannot delight in the Lord if you love the world. These two things do not go together. It's like trying to mix oil and water. Have you ever tried that? Have you ever tried to mix oil and water? They separate and refuse to combine. The same is true of delight in the Lord and love of the world. They cannot be mixed. Turn to 1 John chapter 2. Up to this point in the chapter, John is discussing how to know the Lord and our spiritual state. He then sets aside some space in his letter about loving the world. John writes starting in verse 15, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. John saw the difference. He saw the difference between the things of the world and the things of God. He knew that loving one makes it impossible to truly love the other. But how many times, how many times do we compromise our love of God for the love of worldly things? It's very tempting, isn't it? I can't tell you how many times I've heard, well, yeah, I know the Bible says that, 
but it breaks my heart when I hear the things like that person knows what God says. He knows what God desires, but instead of choosing those things, he chooses the things of the world. Can this person truly delight in the Lord? Or does he just like to pretend to feel safe? Like I said before, it takes work in order to delight in the Lord. If we're always working for worldly things instead of the things of God, which do we really love? What do we really love? I want to quote Bob Dylan. You, some of you folks in here are probably close to my age and might remember Bob Dylan. But in the song where he states, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes. Indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. What can we delight in the Lord? Now we must make a choice and make the effort to delight in the Lord. As Bob Dylan said, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. I choose to serve the Lord. When we choose to serve the Lord, there are many different things about God that we can delight in. The first thing that we can delight in is God's love. We can take great pleasure just from the simple idea that God loves each and every one of us. Jesus proved that love for us on the cross. Do you want to know how much Jesus loves you? Look to the cross and see. Also his faithfulness. God is completely faithful to us all. The time I just want to mention different scriptures that show the faithfulness of God. Corinthians 1 verse 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 1 verse 9, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, we, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. We can see many different ways that God is faithful in the scriptures. There are many, many more, but I just wanted to give you a taste of the faithfulness of God. Just these four scriptures show that he is faithful to call us into fellowship with Jesus, to cleanse us from sin, establish us, to guard us from evil, and never give up on us even when we falter. This is something that we can take great delight in. The next thing that we can delight in are the laws of God. I'm not talking about the Mosaic law, although we can all appreciate the fact that we no longer live under that. I'm talking about the new covenant in Jesus. Paul certainly took delight in it because it was able to take away his sin. He said in Romans 7 verse 22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Up to that point he was talking about being captive to sin. But here he notes that the law, the commands of Jesus Christ and what he did for us, set him free from that sin and death, and we can do the same. And then we can also delight particularly in God's plan. From the very beginning in Genesis, we can see God's plan for salvation of mankind. He shows the coming of the Messiah in Genesis 3, where he tells the devil that while he may bruise the heel of the Messiah, he will crush the devil's head. We see God's plan when he brought the Israelites out of Egypt. We see it when he sent numerous prophets in the Old Testament to warn Israel about its wandering from God. We see God's plan when we see Jesus on the cross dying a horrific death to take away the sins of the world. If we look closely and we make the effort to serve God, we will see his plan in our lives today. Let us live trusting the Lord, delighting in the Lord. We have just considered what it means to trust in the Lord as well as to delight yourself in the Lord. 
Now we consider the third thing that the psalmist writes to do in or to the Lord. Commit your ways to the Lord. I don't know about you. I, I like to go to movies from time to time, but I really love the movie Saving Private Ryan. You know, it's a very graphic movie, but a very accurate representation of what our fighting men went through during World War II. A group of soldiers was dropped in onto the beaches of Normandy, France on D-Day. Just after D-Day, a group of soldiers is given the task to track down Private Ryan, to send him home since all his brothers were killed in action and he was the last surviving son in his family. The soldiers went through awful, awful things. A few of the soldiers, even the commander of the group, lost their lives trying to find and rescue this man. They went through horrific things, but they were totally committed to their task to bring this man home alive. How committed are we to the Lord? Are we committed to the Lord like the soldiers in saving Private Ryan? Or do we just show up to church to make ourselves feel better? How much importance do we as Christians place on going to church? I hope a lot. What example did the early church set? You can read about that in Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. But the question, do you go to church every Sunday? How many of us are tied up in other things on the Lord's Day? What do we allow to take up the time in our lives? Do we allow football to be the number one thing on Sunday? I know many people who make the Indianapolis Colts and the Chicago Bears their Lord instead of God. Do we allow sleeping in to take the first place in our lives on Sundays, you know, mind over mattress? Do you serve in the church? When we serve in the church, we're serving God. How can you serve in the church? Are you willing to lead a Bible study? Women, are you supporting the ministries of the church? What about a woman's Bible study led by a woman? Paul warns not to forsake the church. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you see the day approaching. When we forsake God's church, when we forsake God's church, we're forsaking God himself. What happens when we don't fully commit ourselves to the church? What about the story of Ananias and Sapphira? In Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. You remember that story? They owned a piece of property. Josh alluded read part of that tonight. It's actually in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. I won't take the time to read it, but Ananias came in after they sold their property. And he laid it at the feet of Paul. And Paul asked him, he said, why have you lied to the Spirit? Why did you do this? Was it not your own? After you sold it, was not what you sold it for your own? Couldn't you do with it what you wanted to? But then you come in and say, this is what we got. And then what happened to him? As soon as he was told that, he died. And the young men carried him out. The Bible tells us that approximately three hours later, his wife came in and she was asked, did you sell property for this amount? And then the question came up, why did the two of you decide to deceive and to lie to the Holy Spirit? Because you didn't lie to us, you lied to God. And he said, the same young men that carried your husband out will now carry you out. And she took her last breath and she died. Notice that Ananias and Sapphira, they weren't committed to the Lord. They were committed to what? 
They were committed to themselves. When we are only committed to ourselves or to worldly things, we cannot expect it to end well. They were punished and so shall we be. Commit yourself to God's word. What does it look like to be committed to God's word? Psalms 119 verses 9 through 16. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much in all riches, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. This is what it looks like to be totally committed to God's word. Let's take a look at what this devotion looks like. It denotes that hiding God's word in one's heart guards from sin. It identifies what sin is. It shows how much God hates sin. It shows the punishment for sin. It shows that when we sin, we are disappointing God and going against his will. Verse 12 of that, God's word tells us what God's laws are. The new covenant in Jesus Christ. Verse 13 of that tells us God's word shows his judgment on right and wrong. People are quick to tell Christians not to judge. But brethren, when we use scripture, we're not judging by our own measures. But rather we are simply repeating the judgment that God has already made. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, the scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture is referring to the Old and the New Testament. What is scripture good for? It's good for doctrine, it's good for theology, reproof of our thoughts, correction of our actions. Instructions in righteousness. In Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. God's word will outlast us all. It's eternal. Everything will pass away, but the word of God will not. His ordinances are eternal until God himself lifts them. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is discern, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's word is completely accurate. It is completely true. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and able to teach completely the difference between right and wrong. The scriptures are active in that they are able to discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We've already discussed the first three statements that the psalmist says to do to or with, in or to the Lord. We've talked about what it means to trust the Lord, to delight yourself in the Lord and commit your way to the Lord. Now must we must take the last piece. Now we will discuss what it means to rest in the Lord. First of all, we need to realize that we spend way too much time talking. You can ask Janice. She says, I talk way too much. Have you ever known a person that seems like they won't just shut up for a while? What did you think of this person? Were they annoying? When a person talks too much, it wears on you. Did they constantly speak on subjects that they have little or no knowledge about, but pretended as if they were an expert on the subject? We all, know, we all know someone like this. We all tend to ignore that person completely after they've done this for a while, even if they speak on a subject which they have great knowledge. Did they become diversely opinionated and not be open to discussion with an open mind? Closed-minded statements like I'm always right or I've already made up my mind. 
talking too much leads to a one-sided conversation where the person who can't get in a word edgewise resents the other. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 2 and 3, Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God, for God is in heaven and you on earth. Therefore let your words be few, for a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Brethren, God is warning us to talk, that we talk not to talk too much, or to be overly talkative, Notice that a fool's voice is known by his many words. This isn't saying not to have long conversations or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But rather to listen to others and not have one-sided conversations. Also notice that talking too much and too one-sidedly hurts our reputation with others. This is important when we're witnessing or trying to bring someone else to Christ. When our reputation is damaged, so is our witness. We need to learn to listen more. A wise person once said to me, God made you with two ears and one mouth, so you should be listening twice as much as you're speaking. James 1 verse 19 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. What happens? What happens when we don't listen well to God? We may not hear what God is telling us. You might as well be ignoring his word altogether. We run the risk of only hearing part of the message. A partial truth is sometimes more dangerous than an outright lie. For example, Satan knew in the Garden of Eden that God forbade eating fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but he twisted it into a partial truth. When he asked Eve if they may not eat of any of the trees in the garden, we're put at risk of believing false doctrine. When we don't completely listen to God, you and I run the risk of believing only partial truths, which are not the whole truth, and therefore they're wrong. What happens when we do take time to be silent before the Lord and listen? We're able to come to a proper and true faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10 verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Brethren, we gain instruction. How are we to serve the Lord? How are we to live? What does Jesus expect of you and me? We gain wisdom and instruction. Psalms 1 verses 1 through 7, be still before the Lord. We tend to live in a go-go world or a go-go society. People are always on the move and always busy doing something. I can't tell you how many times I've invited someone to services or some church function only for them to tell me that they're too busy to make it. Are you too busy for God is a question. Are you too busy for God? We need to take time to rejuvenate ourselves both physically and spiritually. Why did God institute the Sabbath? If you remember, he talked a great deal about what he did. These verses show that God rested for a day after the work of creation. Did he have to rest? No. He rested to make an example for us to follow. We aren't God, and we do need to rest. Medically speaking, not resting can cause high blood pressure, anxiety, depression, heart attacks, as well as many other health problems. We need to rest physically. As important as it is to rest physically, we also need to spiritually rest. We live in a society that shoves sin down our throats every single day. Television, magazines, music, billboards, etc., and I could go on and on. In England, it isn't anything for a poster in the park to have a picture of a naked woman on it. There is a reason they say sex sells. We need spiritual rest from the sin of the world. How do we recharge spiritually? Philippians 4, verse 6 through 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding 
will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Praying and talking to God will allow us, will allow us to be alleviated of the world's sinfulness. Lay your burdens at the feet of Jesus. Matthew 28, verse 30. Come to me, all you who are laboring and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Brethren, spend time in the presence of God and his word. He promised Moses in Exodus 33, verse 14, in chapter 33, verse 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Simply acknowledge God as God. Psalms 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Brethren, simply acknowledge God as God. Finally, we must wait on the Lord. We can do nothing on our own, and if we tried, it probably wouldn't be good enough. God promises to help us, but we must wait on him and be patient. We need to wait on the Lord for his perfect plan. Conclusion of all of this, we've talked about what it means to rest in the Lord. We must take time to listen and be silent before the Lord. We must be still before the Lord, and we must wait for the Lord. If you do these things, you will be able to fully rest in the Lord. As we end this lesson through the first seven verses of Psalm 37, let's take the things that we have learned and apply them to ourselves. Remember always to trust in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your ways to the Lord and rest in the Lord. I appreciate your attention greatly and thank you for being here. Uh, would you lead us in a closing prayer, Brother sure. Carter? that